And when it comes to quarterbacks in the 2016 NFL Draft, as I referenced with Christian Hackenberg, sometimes a, a label of polarizing will be mistakenly attached or associated with an individual prospect. And, you know, it doesn't fit to me with Hackenberg. I think it does fit more, let's say, with the Connor Cook because some people view him as a late first to mid-second round talent. Other people like me view him as a fourth or fifth round talent. The draft range is very wide and very varying with this guy. Another guy that I think is very polarizing as a prospect, more so just in the sense of either you like him or you just don't, is Kevin Hogan. Here's a guy that we've seen the past four years at Stanford was tasked with a very difficult responsibility of taking over after Andrew Luck's time at Stanford. You know, those are big shoes to fill, a guy that ended up being the number one overall pick in the 2012 draft. You want to talk about pressure, you want to talk about expectations and having to live up to hype. You know, I think overall throughout his career, while Kevin Hogan was never spectacular, and I wouldn't exactly call him a stud, I thought he did a good, solid job, and he was a good, solid performer and a good, solid quarterback for the Stanford Cardinal. And you look at a dude now heading into the NFL level, I realize some people don't like him because he didn't make the big splash plays. He's got a hideous throwing motion. And you look at some of these weaknesses, and this is where I talk about, again, sometimes with prospects. We focus too much on who they aren't or what they can't do and maybe not enough on their positives and what they do have. And I look at a guy like Hogan, and I think that he gets a bit of a raw deal. And I think he's a better prospect than people want to give him credit for. You're talking about a guy six foot three, 220 or so pounds, a four-year starter, redshirt senior coming from Stanford. So you know this is a smart kid, a guy with a lot of experience, but he's got more than that. He's got good size, like I mentioned, six foot three, 220 pounds. He's big enough to play the position. He's got a good solid build too. So not only is he tall enough, but he's also put together muscularly. So you don't have to worry about him being frail or potentially getting injured a lot. I think at the NFL level, a guy that will surprise you with his ability to move on his feet. I mean, he's not a huge threat to run with the ball, but he can run a little bit. He's not somebody you want to have scrambling a ton, but if it's called for, if it's dictated, it's necessary, he can do so. He can extend plays a little bit with his feet. He can, you know, make some plays happen on his feet as a passer. You know, I think in terms of as a pocket passer, though, that's where you're looking at him having to make a name for himself at the NFL level, potentially. He's a guy with good, short, and intermediate area arm strength. Not a hose or a cannon, but strong enough to make every throw within a 15 to 20 yard window. He's got pretty good short and intermediate area accuracy as well. I think his field vision over the four years at Stanford got better. You know, while he played in a system that kind of kept it close to the vest for the quarterback, it didn't ask you to do a lot of crazy things. Here was a guy that did show me at times the ability, you know, to go through his progressions, to find his secondary option, to find his hot read, to be able to not just always stare down that primary target. A guy with, like I said, a lot of experience, again, and experience playing in a more traditional style pro offense. So he's used to playing under center. He's used to playing out of the gun. You know, he's a guy at Stanford that you could trust and make some of the calls at the line, make some audibles because of that experience, because of his intellect, because of his understanding of the game, but also a tough dude, too. I mean, this is a guy that took some big shots over four years and a guy that I thought held up very, very well. You know, a very solid leader, just a lot of intangible things about Hogan. When I watch him, you know, he's not a top flight prospect, but I don't think he's the bum that a lot of people have made him out to be. Now, sure, he's got weaknesses, and they're big weaknesses. First off, we get to his throwing mechanics. I think this is why a lot of people are immediately and quickly ready to dismiss him as in his chances at the NFL level because his, his throwing mechanics are not that good. Well, they're not. I will get you, grant you that. But Phillip Rivers had a hideous throwing motion, too, and he was once a fourth overall pick. You know, he's a borderline Hall of Famer. I mean, he's been a franchise quarterback for a decade now. You know, just because a guy's throwing motion isn't the prettiest doesn't mean that he can't be successful at the NFL level. With that said, though, you would like to see him improve that throwing motion. You'd like to see him bring it a little bit more over the top. You'd like to see him shorten it up a little bit, make it a little more compact, because he doesn't have a rocket arm to begin with. Like, at least with Phillip Rivers, he had a really strong natural arm. So when you're talking about that elongated, kind of awkward throwing motion, he still had the arm strength to be able to pull that off and hit the tight throwing windows and hit the spots at the NFL level. I'm not as sure that Kevin Hogan can do that. And you saw this at time in college, too. Well, his short and intermediate 
area accuracy was good. In terms of throwing the deep ball, I thought he was very inconsistent with that. In terms of his overall ball placement, either in the short and intermediate areas, you know, it's something as you lengthen your swing in golf, you know, you could be getting power, but you could be sacrificing accuracy. Similar thing as a thrower as well. The longer that throwing motion is and the more moving parts you have, the longer it takes, uh, the longer it takes the ball to ultimately leave your hand, meaning the longer it takes for that ball to get there, and it can affect accuracy, and in particular in this case for him, uh, ball placement. Another bad thing when you're talking about that long throwing motion, because you're kind of gearing up and you're winding up, it tends to be a little bit harder to throw with touch. When you watch Hogan, even the last couple of years, you saw a guy that had a tendency to throw one velocity and one line. It tended to be straight. It tended to be a line drive top to throw. Not a lot of bucket throws. Not a lot of looping touch balls. You know, And that's something you have to be able to throw those balls sometimes at the NFL level. And just with his throwing motion, it can be restrictive in his ability to do that. Also, another concern I have for him is his throwing under pressure. You know, for a guy that is this experience, he made some bad throws in the face of pressure. He really did. And furthermore, in general, in facing pressure, even if he didn't make bad throws, because of the setup that he has to have and the throwing motion that he has, he has to have a cleaner pocket than others. And he doesn't have the natural arm strength of Rivers to be able to compensate for that long motion. He has to be able, Hogan does, to set his feet in the pocket and throw from a pretty clean pocket, I think, in order to be effective. So when you get at his feet and you can pressure him and move him off of the spot, it only, if anything, lengthens the throwing motion, saps more velocity and accuracy off of the ball. And that is something that is going to be a concern for me. You know, and it also, I think at times he was a bit unsure of himself in the pocket in the face of pressure up the middle, and in particular the blitzing off the edge. It's something you'd like to see a guy with four years of starting experience in the Pac-10 at a major program like Stanford, frankly, be better at than he actually is. I better get in, though. You know, like I said, those are those are concerns, but a lot of them tie into the throwing mechanics. But I think if you're just looking at throwing mechanics alone and dismissing them, I think you're making a mistake. Now, here, I'm not here to sit there and say that Kevin Hogan is going to be a big-time stud starting quarterback at the NFL level. I don't think he has that type of upside. I don't think he has that type of potential. But when you're talking about the NFL draft, not everybody is destined to be a star. Not everybody is destined to be a starter. And not everybody needs to be a long-term starter to still be a productive and worthwhile NFL draft pick. And when I look at a guy like Kevin Hogan, I see a guy that, worst-case scenario, you get him into your system, he's a quality backup. Maybe he's a guy that you can win some spot starts with. I don't know if he'll ever be a starting quarterback at the NFL level. But I feel pretty confident that you feel pretty good about him at least being a quality reserve, a quality backup behind your quarterback for years, especially if you have a guy that's somewhat injury prone. You know, So I look at Kevin Hogan, and I think he's a fourth-round choice in this year's draft. I think he's a fourth-round talent. I know that's probably the ceiling of where you think anybody's going to rate him, and a lot of people probably going to view him as like a seventh-round pick or an undrafted guy. But I think there are some teams that are going to value that experience in the system where he played under center, he played under the gun, knowing he went to Stanford so he can't be a knucklehead, knowing at times that he had very good football intelligence, a guy that is good in the short and medium, intermediate areas, both in terms of his accuracy and arm strength, you know, with that size and, you know, underrated athleticism, you've got something to work with. Like I said, I don't know if you've got an NFL starter, but you've at least, worst case scenario, got a really quality, solid backup for the next several years. And to me, when you're talking about taking guys in day three, you'd love nothing more than to gamble on a guy with big-time athletic upside and hope he pans out. But this is the type of solid pick that at some point in time could end up being a starter for you, similar to what the Bears once did with Kyle Orton taking him in the fourth round in 2005. You know, a somewhat similar type of scenario. Now, Orton had, you know, in theory, a little bit more upside than a Hogan does, but a guy that in worst-case scenario, you feel like you've got a pretty good backup. You know, and, and if anything else, maybe a guy that could occasionally step in and start, it could start for you at some point in time. And Hogan might be able to start for somebody at some point in time. We'll see. But again, worst case scenario, fourth round talent that ends up being a solid backup at the NFL for several years.